There's a maniac who seeks to end us all. We must do something. The Guardians. Give me those. And Jane, the old ex-girlfriend. Jodie Foster. Jane Foster. A kill. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Tickets are on sale for Marvel Studios' Thor Love and Thunder. That's right, we're back. And we've got so much to show you. Like goats and corgs. Well, one corg. Kids get to popcorn now. New worlds. New Thors. New Asgard. New goats. Seriously, why the goat obsession? No reason. Welcome back, everyone. There's a brand new Thor Love and Thunder trailer video. There's a bunch of new footage and Easter eggs, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. There's a bunch of really big stuff coming up, and we're doing some really cool giveaways, too. I'll start with the brand new footage, then I'll talk about Thor versus Thanos, the Celestials, and some of the other really powerful cosmic characters that you see show up in the trailers. When you talk about the most powerful characters in the MCU, the multiverse, because now we've seen the multiverse in Doctor Strange 2, they're actual gods, which we do see during this movie, of many different power levels. They're cosmic beings like the Celestials, and then you have cosmic entities, which are basically ideas given physical form. All of them have vastly different power levels, and they just keep getting more and more powerful. Like, you're talking about the most OP stuff you've ever seen in the MCU. The Celestials in the Eternals movie was just the beginning of this. During the gore storyline in the comics, Thor briefly gains enough power to become the god of gods, basically, inside the MCU. So during the trailer, you see footage of Thor trying to rally a new team of Revengers. It's a bit of a callback to Thor Ragnarok. It's only a couple of characters because it's everybody you see go to Olympus. Korg, Valkyrie, and Jane Foster's Thor character. The Guardians of the Galaxy have already kind of gone their separate way by that point in the movie. I love the idea, though, that he takes the tour boat, like he takes the boat that they're using for tours, he takes the goats with him, and he takes Mjolnir to use the Rainbow Bridge on the boat instead of just taking them with the Rainbow Bridge. The funny thing is that he doesn't actually need the goats, he doesn't need the ship either. He can open the Bifrost directly with Stormbreaker, so he doesn't need to do that. You notice the boat is called the Aegir here on the side, that's just the Norse personification of the actual sea. They have the funny joke about Taika bringing the actual goat into the promo that they did for the movie, like, buy tickets and don't mind this goat that's just walking around here on this set. He uses them to travel around the universe when he becomes unworthy during the Mighty Thor storyline. But because that's not an issue during this movie, it's just more of a funny thing, like, okay, we're gonna use the boat, we'll use the goats, we'll use Stormbreaker to take it the slow way. The funny scene of Thor trying to play hype man to the new Revengers team that he's putting together to go fight Gore is just inside one of the main halls at New Asgard. The joke here is that Valkyrie is just getting really bored with the idea of being king. Like, she thought that it would be cool, but it's just a lot of paperwork. Also trying to earn money and help her people, which is where all the tourism stuff comes in, which she's not super happy about either. So the whole idea is that she loves the idea of going on this adventure with Thor to go fight this giant battle against someone who's threatening to kill all the gods in the universe. She also misses the Valkyrie, like she's really sad because all of her sisters died when they were fighting Hela and it's been a long time since she's been with them. So when Jane Foster gets Mjolnir and becomes a version of Thor, she gets really excited about that and thinks of her as a sister of hers. So it is always possible that Jane Foster could help reform the Valkyrie under King Valkyrie at New Asgard. They are doing the cancer subplot, so Mjolnir does kill her just a little bit every time she uses its power, but that's because it burns all the chemo out of her body, so the cancer just comes back and starts killing her faster every time she becomes Thor. And like I talk about Thor becoming god of gods briefly during the storyline, even though she becomes worthy enough to wield Mjolnir and it reforms, and that gives her the power of Thor, that doesn't also make her like a super powerful god of gods level character. It just gives her the same level of power that Thor had when Odin made that enchantment, which was kind of like a mid-level version of Thor. The ways the gods become more powerful, though, is by gaining more followers, and they can go through other cosmic trials, gain other cosmic artifacts, gain big power-ups themselves. Gore is one of those characters, too, where he basically goes around killing all the gods, trying to attain more power, basically taking the power of different gods. It sounds like that's kind of the way the Necro Sword is working in the movie, like it's leeching the life force out of different gods because... This actually looks like a version of the God Bomb. This giant black and white nebula planet looking area here where you see them fighting. One of the distinctions now that you can see because there's some extra footage is when Thor is swinging Stormbreaker at the Necro Sword. He's black and white, everything around them is black and white, but you see color pouring off of Thor in his armor. So they're trying to show you the power of the gods in a visual kind of way. In the way the Necro Sword seems like it's absorbing that. When he's reading off his new team, he mentions the Guardians of the Galaxy. They have that funny scene with Groot and Rocket. The way they cut that in the trailer is a little misleading. It's happening during a completely different part of the movie. That's all during the early part of the film when Thor is having his existential crisis before he goes back to New Asgard with Valkyrie. But I do love the scene where Korg forgets what her name is and calls her Jodie Foster. 
Jodie Foster, also legit famous, he would be familiar with some of Earth's culture at this point. Then there's actually a huge Easter egg where Gorge says, you're not like the other gods that I fought before. When he actually fights Thor for the first time, he's already been killing gods for a long time. He's already mowed through a bunch of them. There was going to be a big reference to that during Moon Knight, but it's when he encounters Thor that he comes up with the idea to go back in time and take the power of all these other gods and basically winds up becoming a god himself, so to speak. Because when he fights Thor for the first time, it's the first time that he's ever had trouble killing a god. Thor's able to hold his own against him, and it really surprises him. Because the movie's only going to be about two hours long, obviously they're not going to do the entire gore storyline from the comics, so there'll probably only be some easter eggs for the god bomb storyline, which is basically the end of the gore storyline. And even though we just had the Loki series with Kang and a bunch of time travel, we just had Doctor Strange 2 with a bunch of multiverse with different versions of characters. During the gore storyline in the comics, there are multiple versions of Thor from different parts in the timeline. You have a young Thor, you have middle-aged Thor, and then you have old King Thor. I think they've replaced the multiple Thor storyline with the mighty Thor storyline, so you still have two versions of Thor, but it's just present-day Thor with Jane Foster's Thor. We might still get that scene where he does wield two hammers, so to speak. Now, it would be Stormbreaker and Mjolnir, so technically it's not two hammers, it's an axe and a hammer. It would be a cool callback to Avengers Endgame because he was about to do that before Captain America showed up and he started wielding Mjolnir. But in the comics, the big deal with him wielding two hammers is that the hammers themselves contain sentient cosmic storms. So basically, he's wielding more power than anyone's ever had in the entire MCU at that point. That brief moment gives him so much of a power up that he smashes both hammers together and it winds up destroying all of Gore's plans with his god bomb. It basically destroys the entire thing and winds up absorbing the Necro Sword. So wielding the power of two hammers and the power of the Necro Sword makes him god of gods inside the MCU very briefly. The big Easter egg I think for that where Thor basically becomes the most powerful he's ever been for a brief period is when he's here with Jane Foster's Thor, they're clutching hands, and he's talking about why he's more powerful because he's fighting for something that he loves. They'll tie him becoming a more cosmic version of the character, like God of Gods briefly, back around to the title, Love and Thunder. That's kind of the way these giant Hollywood movies work too, is that usually the big twist of the movie in the end, like the way they defeat the villain, has something to do with the theme of the actual title. The big connection between Gore and Thanos is that they both have giant universe-spanning plans, and they both have a similar arc, they both feel like they were wronged by their people. Gore, I think, is a little more sympathetic, though. Thanos goes around balancing the universe one planet at a time, eventually trying to save the universe, albeit doing it in a really WTF kind of way. Eventually, he gets his big power up, the Infinity Stones, and tries to do it in one fell swoop. Gore basically goes through the exact same type of arc. Now, he's wronged by the gods, so he wants to kill them all because he feels like they're terrible, and he's not wrong. You've seen Khonshu in the Moon Knight series. He is terrible. But he started out doing things the same way that Thanos did, going around one pantheon at a time, killing all the gods. Eventually, he tries to work smarter, not harder, and develops a way to do it all at once. His Infinity Stone version of the plan. That is the god bomb. What's going on here looks like his grand plan to basically wipe out all gods across the entire cosmos, all in one fell swoop. So for those of you asking who's more powerful, Gore or Thanos, eventually Gore would become more powerful, but that's following the Gore storyline in the comics, and he winds up going back to kill an Elder God and steal his power at the beginning of time, basically giving him as much power as you could possibly ever get. So when we talk about Elder Gods, that's like Cthone, the God of Chaos, the person who gave Scarlet Witch all of her chaos magic. There was an Easter egg for him during Doctor Strange 2. So they've started to canonize the Elder Gods inside the MCU in a much bigger way. Maybe we'll see them in some of the crazier supernatural-based movies in the future. When they bring Scarlet Witch back eventually, and they will bring her back, mark my words, she is not dead. If they did a Scarlet Witch solo movie, then they would probably do Cthone in a movie like that. Taika Waititi did say there would be a bunch of cameos in the movie, so lay all your bets in the comments below about who's going to show up. Speaking of Sony, though, they just released a brand new first look at Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse. I'll try to finish my Easter eggs and breakdown video for it before the end of the day, but if I don't finish it, then I'll post it early tomorrow morning. While you wait for everything, everyone click here for my Marvel Thunderbolts announcement video and click here for my Miss Marvel Episode 1 video. Thank you so much for watching. Everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.